Well, hi there. My name is Clint Laidlaw. I have a PhD in biology as well as a master's degree and an undergraduate degree in biology and in zoology. I run a biology outreach called Clint's Reptile Room in Springville, Utah. I'm a university instructor and online instructor of animal biology here on the YouTube channel Clint's Reptiles, which is where you are right now. And until about a week ago, I had never been on TikTok. But people keep telling me that I had to check it out. And though I think that TikTok is a poison on our society, I've already reviewed two Who Would Win books. How much worse can TikTok possibly be? So let's take a look at some animal content on TikTok. Mr. Jason, uh, what, do you, what do you have for me? Uh, so we have four categories. We have scary animal encounters, uh, amazing animal abilities, unidentified animals, and, because you love them, gorillas. All right, so what's up first? Let's, let's just go in that order, scary animal encounters. Okay. Uh, so for each video, could you tell us kind of uh, some background on what's going on in the video and how much danger were they really in? All right. Okay, so this is the first one. TikTok. <laughs> I want to see that one one more time. Okay, this is a person on a motorcycle getting charged by a tiger. <laughs> as far as how much danger they're in, so much danger, so much danger. I so I want to go to Asia. So so we we last year. Will and I went to the Peruvian Amazon for two weeks and just documented all the things we could find. And like the Amazon isn't a perfectly safe place. There were black caiman, there's green anacondas, there's bushmasters and various other venomous snakes. Uh, there's uh, jaguars. There are, there are uh, malaria. There's lots of things that could potentially kill you there. But really at no point did I feel like I was in terrific danger. And I've been thinking I want to do the same thing in Thailand because th that'd be a whole different world of amazing rainforest creatures. But then when we were recently down talking to Chandler uh, from Chandler's Wildlife, he was telling us about a when he was in Thailand and he mentioned concern about tigers. And I started thinking about that. I'm like, ooh, tigers. Tigers are, that's some next level stuff. And I started researching more because it's like, it's like there are mountain lions here. And I'm careful with my kids and stuff when we're on hikes to always stay together, things like that. But I'm not, I mean, they're the thing I'm the most worried about, but I'm not terribly concerned about mountain lions because they don't actually kill that many people. So my question was like, how many people are actually killed by tigers? Because if it's like, if it's like 30 people a year, it's like, well, you know, they're, they're in multiple countries with over a billion people in them. Like I, that can happen. I can, I can live with 30 people. So I started looking it up and the best number comes from a study that was conducted between the years uh, 1800 and, and 2009. So this is like 209 years worth of data. But the number of people was 373,000, <laughs> which, is, which is about 1800 people a year, every year. There's one, one female tiger killed over 400 people. Going, going back to the video, also for the record, uh, tigers run 30 to 40 miles an hour. So some of them have been collected uh, almost 50 miles an hour. That's bonkers. The, the thing is like, if you get attacked by a mountain lion, A, you're a very intimidating thing for a mountain lion to attack. And B, you've actually got a shot in a fight with a mountain lion of pro probably not killing it, but people have killed mountain lions with their bare hands, but probably not killing it, but at least putting up a big enough fight that the mountain lion reconsiders. With a tiger, the only reason you don't get killed by a tiger is simply because the tiger has decided not to kill you or you didn't, you were not detected by a tiger. If a tiger attacks you, like you're probably gonna die. And I've seen them jump up and try to pull people off of the faces of elephants, right? They're, on, they're sitting on an elephant and they charge the elephant front on and leap up at the people on the elephant's back. Um, anyway, tigers are terrifying. I'm, I'm genuinely 
very afraid of tigers. And so uh, Australia and New Zealand look pretty good. <laughs> Okay. This video is sponsored by Ridge. Some of you may know that I'm a big fan of awesome cars, so much so that I named my false water cobra Shelby after the Shelby Cobra. It turns out that Ridge is also a big fan of awesome cars. So get this, without spending a dollar, you can earn a free entry to win this unbelievable Hennessy Velociraptor Ford Bronco just by visiting ridge.com and clicking enter now. That thing is unbelievably cool. Or if you're not into cars, uh, how about $75,000 cash if you're into that kind of thing. But I should mention that you can get an additional entry for every single dollar you spend at ridge.com and that includes amazing Hennessy products like this Hennessy Ridge wallet or like this Hennessy key case which will get you up to an additional thousand entries. A thousand. Ridge has over 800,000 five-star reviews. And as a Ridge carrier myself, I totally understand why they get those five stars. And if you use my link, ridge.com slash Clint, you'll receive an additional 10 bonus entries. And by entering my code Clint during checkout, you'll also enjoy 10% off. If you've ever been considering getting a Ridge, now is the best time. Now back to TikTok. Here we go. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Well, then go slow and just walk and look at me. Don't even look, look over there. Just walk. He's not going to move you. You just go slow. He's not going to move? Yeah, just go slow. Just walk. I, walk. I run? Yeah, run. Whoa! He did come in! Yeah! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I did it. Oh, she doesn't look happy about that. I want to... I've seen this one before. But I haven't taken a really good look at it. Okay. Okay, well, so this lady looks like she's out on a hike with a fella. And there's a snake up on the hill. Looks to be some sort of a colubrid snake. It's long and skinny and quick. Uh, dark. If I had to guess, it's either probably a black racer or uh, a black rat snake. But that's a guess. And... He's he, he's instructing her. She looks like she's pretty scared of snakes generally and he's telling her just to kind of walk by it and as she Runs towards it the snake lunges forward and starts going across which so for starters uh, She's in no danger like I don't well, this does not look to be a snake that has any venom or anything like that but as far as why the snake did that, you know generally speaking, you know I talked to a lot of people who are scared of snakes and I'm like, have you ever been bitten by any sort of a snake ever when you're just out minding your own business? And the answer is always, almost always, no. Uh, usually if, if you do, if you do, and you know, get bitten by a snake, you probably stepped on it or you're picking it up or something like that. But if you get bitten by a snake while you're just out walking, you, you pretty much have to step on it. This snake, I mean, it might have struck at her because as I went back and watched this, let's see here. So she's. Just walk. walk. Snake is just sitting yeah, there. And and but she runs. As far as the snake is concerned, she starts because she's a down the trail from it. So she runs towards the snake. She's not running exactly right at it, but she's running in the direction of the snake. So the snake up till that point looked like it was doing plan A defense for a snake, which is hold still and hope you're not noticed. But as soon as something runs at it, it's got to respond. That might have been a strike, but I really don't think it was. I think the snake running uphill wasn't going to be a good option for it. And so it's just darting down the hill in response to the fact that she ran towards it. The end. All right. Good one. Oh, that takes some nerves, doesn't it?
See the ears out. This is a mock charge. The elephant's trying to figure him out. What is going on? So how much danger was he in? Uh, some. Right, that, was, that, was, that was not no danger. Elephants in Africa kill hundreds of people every year. Um, <laughs> probably, so the way it was acting with its, with its ears out like that, you know, the elephant was trying to look big and intimidating. And you'll see a lot of animals like this, that when they, when they charge at you, they charge at you differently when they mean to kill you versus when they're just trying to scare you off. And most elephant charges are mock charges like this, where that elephant is going, look, I'm big and I'm huge and you better run off. Because actually engaging in combat with any sort of large animal, I mean, it has risks. And so they don't necessarily want to fight everything that they could beat in a fight. But they're, he's charging in there. And, you know, one thing is that elephant's tr trying to scare him off and trying to get a read on how he's going to respond. You know, if he's going to respond aggressively back immediately towards the elephant, then it might actually need to fight it because it's something actually trying to hurt the elephant. But, uh, you know, that that total calm when, when you're standing there, I mean, that's that's a, an ex extremely unusual response for any other animal to, to give to the elephant. You know, so that elephant spent a long time standing there like, whoa, what do I do about this? And, you know, it's just trying to read this guy. It's like, surely he's terrified, right? But you know, like, like there's, there's that situation, you know, you, you can see that with people, right? If you're a big, tough dude and this little guy's there and you start threatening him and he just stands there like Kobe Bryant when they're throwing the ball in his face, you know, after a while you're like, hmm, what does he know that I don't know? Like this guy, that's too much confidence. Something's wrong here. And so, you know, that elephant goes for one more. Okay, well, how about this one? You know, gets, gets extra, extra in his face. You know, after that, he kind of, Beats on the ground a little bit, and he's the elephant's just like, all right, forget this. This is <laughs> I've, I've had enough of this. That is that's quite an experience. That is probably the best thing you could do if an elephant charges you is just stand your ground and seem unconcerned about it. I'm not sure what percentage of humans have the intestinal fortitude to pull that off, but uh, that would be the way to go. So, so like I said, most of the time it's going to be a mock charge. There are a couple of times of year or situations where it very well might not be a, a, a mock charge. One of those is when the, the males are in what's called musk. So there is a breeding season and the males get all hopped up on testosterone and they're just fighting everything around and, and constantly trying to mate. And, and it's very, very apparent when they are in musk. I'll leave it at that. But a male and musk would be an extremely dangerous animal. The other one would be if you've got a mother elephant defending a baby, you know, she might charge you in earnest. Most of the rest of the time, it's probably a mock charge. Uh, let's switch categories. All right, yeah. Uh, so this is amazing animal abilities. Okay. Uh, what, uh, if you could, for each of these videos, talk about what's going on in the video. Um, is this for real or, you know, is it faked? So what's going on? Is it, is it for real or not? Okay. All right. That's very amazing. Okay, so uh, that is a golden eagle picking up what looks to be an adult red fox and carrying it off. I would say that probably is for real. If, if that, it, like, I, I didn't, you know, it's getting harder and harder to recognize fakes. The reality is golden eagles do hunt foxes. So, I mean, yeah, that, that happens. I think, so I was looking, I think foxes are about 
They're like 10 to 15 pounds red foxes on average. Some, some are bigger, some are like five pounds. I don't think that was a five pound fox, but golden eagles can, can lift weights like that. I think, I think I, I'm, I, I would be curious to see how far it got with that fox. Like, I think it could lift it off the ground, but you could see it was very, very difficult for it to, to carry it very far. What I, I've seen, cause golden eagles are terrifying. So they was saying in the video that that's bigger than a bald eagle and that's true. I've only seen one in person. It was in the middle of a road down by Moab. And so I had to stop for it and it was, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of bald eagles and that golden eagle was amazing. They're not that much bigger than bald eagles, but it looked way bigger to me when I saw this one. And, and you know, there are places, I mean, they, I mean, there, there are people who use golden eagles for falconry to hunt foxes. They, they hunt foxes in the wild. They will hunt goats, like mountain goats and mountain sheep. And they just like, they'll grab adults and pull them off of the mountain and then let gravity do a lot of the work. And then, but they, they lift them off of the mountain. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't fly off with one, but they can lift it up and drop it. So do I think it could pick up an adult red fox? I do. Uh, do I think it could like fly back to its nest with it? I would, I doubt that. I doubt that, but maybe. Okay, let's see, what do we have next? Okay, that was awesome. So that was an Anhinga, uh, which, so I, I love Anhingas and I have a special relationship with Anhingas because I used to work at Disney's Animal Kingdom in the Pangani Forest Trail. And we there's a hippo pool there on the trail and it is full of African cichlids. And the Anhingas would come down there and you see like they swim underneath the water and they call them snake birds for two reasons. One of them is they quickly strike and they spear fish with their bill uh, in the way that the ultimate ocean rumble thought that narwhals used their tusks. But it would it spears them with their bill and then it usually comes up above the water, stands back on a, on a rock or whatever and it would throw them up in the air and catch them and swallow them down. And that's Awesome. I mean, it was so, you know, I had an underwater view of the whole thing and then I could see it and it would happen all the time. One time, one of them speared just an enormous cichlid. I mean, you know, these, these birds, well, they're roughly the size of a cormorant if you've seen them. And I actually only recently learned that they are not themselves cormorants. I thought that they were cormorants because they stand there and they dry their wings and they're built like cormorants just with skinnier bills. They are sister to the cormorants, so they are very closely related, but they're in their own family. I think it's a, I think it's a separate family. And Hinga Day? It's something like that. Anyway, but they're, they're in a separate group from the cormorants, but they, they could be, they're nested together, and so they're sister. They are also related to uh, gannets and to boobies, like the blue-footed booby, uh, and also frigate birds, which I got to see frigate birds down in Isla Mujeres last year, and that was my first time seeing frigate birds and they were everywhere. I loved it. Anyway, when it got that giant cichlid, I was like, there's no way it's going to be able to swallow this down. And then it did. It swallowed the whole dang thing. And that is part of why they're called snake birds because I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. You know, like the, it was that, that fish was this long and that deep. And that bird's neck is this big around. And it just went, and, you know, you could watch it go down the whole way. I was like, there's no way this is ever going to happen. And then than it did there, amazing. And Hinga. Okay, next. All right. He looks like that. And Hinga. Like this shouldn't happen, should it? <laughs> Thank you. 
Look at that, that's just like the green tree monitor. Uses the ground to help position it. Oh jeez. <laughs> oh my goodness. There it is. Oh man, <laughs> look at that. They always wiggle to kind of get it down. No. Yeah, no, that's for real. Monitor lizards almost always swallow their prey hole. I've got a This is an Asian water monitor, and it doesn't open, unfortunately. It's it's glued in place, but you can see. So this is this is the lower jaw. Oh, here I can show you. So this is a Gila monster, but uh, Gila monsters are very closely related to to the monitor lizards, and so their skull isn't built like that of a snake. Uh, snakes they 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 have no uh, fusion between between these two bones up front which allows the lower jaw to splay out wide. Uh, and they've got a lot of, of flexibility in the skull. They've got a very, very kinetic skull up top. I've got a, so this one here is a Gaboon Viper. And you can see like that skull is very, very minimalistic. And it's just kind of like two little arms. And so that, that skull can spread wide open and snakes can swallow really big things. Other lizards, they don't have that. So basically, like if a Gila is gonna swallow something, it's gotta fit through that space. But they don't have the teeth for tearing off pieces, really. I mean, they could potentially death roll a little bit or something like that, but I really don't see that happening too often with most lizard species to tear off pieces, though I'm sure they do on occasion. Generally speaking, though, they just have to get it through that hole. And so they're not gonna be able to swallow things as big as a snake. I mean, snakes, on many occasions will swallow things that are larger in diameter than they are. The, the, that lizard's not gonna do that. But if you think about it, you could fit a pretty big animal, as, basically as long as you could get its head in there. Monitors are very intelligent. They, they will use tools. They use, you know, like all the objects around to try to position it in the right way. And then on top of that, they've got a more stable platform than a snake. And so, you know, they, they can get leverage a little better. So basically, if it can get that head in, you know, they can usually kind of work and gyrate their bodies until they can pull everything through that hole. And uh, Bob's your uncle. That was cool. All right. Okay. Uh, next section. Okay. Unidentified animals. Can you identify it? And tell me about that animal. Okay. <laughs> I know what that is. I'll listen to it. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's a mole rat. And most people most people don't know about mole rats that they even exist. But they do. People people know about naked mole rats. They they have heard of naked mole rats. There are two families actually of mole rats. There are the naked mole rats and then there's like all of the other mole rats. And I think pretty much all of the mole rats, but the naked mole rats, I think there's one other group, but almost all of them are not eusocial. Eusociality meaning that they've got like a queen and then a whole bunch of non-reproductive workers. The other mole rats, everybody reproduces. So th that eusociality is actually extremely unusual in a, in a mammal and really like anything but termites and, and hymenopteran insects. And so, so that's a really weird thing about naked mole rats, but people know that. A uh, couple of similarities, you know, they got terrible vision, they dig. Their incisor teeth come outside of their lips, so their lips can close and the incisor teeth are still sticking out and they chew their way through the ground, unlike moles or something that use big feet. They're biting their way through, which is totally crazy. And so these guys are another one of those groups. They're, 
the mole rats, the naked mole rats, they're, they're, I think they're all in Africa. There may be some that got out of Africa a little bit, but they're, they're, they're pretty much all from Africa and sort of when we were talking about the Afrotherians in, in a video that came out just recently, this is another one of those African groups that has diversified greatly and filled roles that are usually filled by other groups because Africa was an island not so long ago. All right. Look at the face on this thing. Wow. Cute little guy. Dolphin face on a ray, but that, that's just an eagle ray. Well, they're, they're very closely related to manta rays and like devil rays, which I think that's synonymous, but I think they're more in that group. And then also the cow-nosed rays. They're, so they're all in a group. And uh, you know, one thing you'll notice is they've got a very different general shape than like stingrays do. And this is largely because they swim up in the water column more than stingrays do, which are usually buried underneath the substrate. And so they're up swimming. So they're, they're much better swimmers than, than most of the other rays. But anyway, that's, that's just a normal eagle ray. Okay. A paddle border in California just found a mysterious sea creature. Look at the sound. It's transparent, looks like a chain, and is gooey. <laughs> Would you dare touch this? <laughs> what is that? That's a funny creature. I've never seen one of these in person, but I'm pretty sure that is a salp, which is a type of tunicate, which like it kind of, it looks like a cnidarian, but it is actually a chordate. So uh, chordata is the group to which the vertebrates belong, but not all chordates are vertebrates, but all vertebrates are chordates. This is a chordate. This is a very, very weird animal. It's like a lot of cnidarians, it has alternation of generations. So it has an asexual phase, which is, is a, it starts out solitary and it buds off and produces this chain of essential, essentially clones. And the chain is a sequential hermaphrodite, which means that it is male and female at different points during its development, I guess sort of like clownfish. And uh, except, except the opposite direction. It is female first. So when they first mature into adults, they mature as females. And then when they get older, they mature into males. They move around using jet propulsion, which is pretty cool. And while they're pumping water through themselves to move, they also filter feed on phytoplankton. And they grow super duper fast, super fast as it, it kind of in, um, response to phytoplankton blooms. So when there's a bloom of phytoplankton, all of a sudden, shortly thereafter, there will be a bloom of salps. Pretty crazy. Okay. So some guys got a surprise catch out in the ocean. Check out this fish they got, guys. This is absolutely incredible. That's cool. That is so cool. I don't think they growl, though. <laughs> I think that's how they didn't bring it. I know what that is. <laughs> oh, look at this thing. It's like a sailfish. Jesus, <laughs> scared me. That's sick. Hold it. That is a lancet fish. These, those are really cool. So they're, they're carnivorous fish. They live primarily in the, the mesopelagic zone, which is just, it's like where, just between where there's a lot of light and where there's virtually no light in the ocean. So they're, they're, they live in extremely low light. And so they're very, they're a visual predator and they've got those gigantic eyes. Uh, they're scaleless and they don't have a swim bladder, which benefits them greatly because they're down very deep. And a lot of times when you see people catch a deep sea fish, you'll notice that its organs are pouring out of its mouth. And the reason for that is because the swim bladder, as they get pulled up very quickly, it decomp well, they, the compression on them goes down. And so the volume of that swim bladder increases dramatically and faster than they can pull gas out of it. If they were ascending on their own slowly, they would be able to slowly pull gas out. Some fish can burp it out or, or 
effectively farted out, but some have to just pull it out with their bloodstream, and and that's that's very slow. And so if you pull them up quickly, it's it's fatal for them. Even that that doesn't happen to the lancerfish because they don't have a swim bladder, but they are still very susceptible to uh, decompression sickness, the bends. So the same thing, same thing that scuba divers get, just as as the external pressure drops, uh, as they as they raise under high pressure there can be more dissolved gases in the body. And as the pressure decreases, the amount of dissolved gases in the body decreases. And so it, it starts to condense and make its way out into the tissues. And so you get these like bubbles in your tissue. And so that can be absolutely devastating. So if you pull up a lancet fish, even though its guts won't pour up, a lot of times they have a horrible, horrible case of decompression sickness. And that, that can potentially be fatal for them. These guys, while we're on the topic of hermaphrodites, by the way, uh, these are simultaneous hermaphrodites. So before we talked about a sequential hermaphrodite, which is female and then male, Simultaneous hermaphrodites are male and female at the same time, meaning they're making both sperm and eggs, which is very convenient when you live in the deep ocean. These are actually really common fish in the deep ocean. A lot of times they're caught by people who are like fishing on these deep sea lines for tuna and things like that. They're actually caught really, really often, I think. But they, you know, when you live in an area where it's maybe hard to find friends, it's nice that any other lancet fish that you might bump into it's a potential mate. Okay, got another one? Yeah. All right. Okay, so let me watch that one more time, but I'm pretty sure that's a raccoon. That's a good angle right there. That's a naked raccoon. The great naked raccoon. The only question is how did this raccoon get so naked? And it's probably either got mange, which would be mites, or it's got alopecia, which is an autoimmune disease. So one of those things is going wrong. So you've got a hairless raccoon and that's what they look like. All right, what do we have here? Pretty sure that. Yeah, that's a saltwater crocodile. I think. Okay, so it's definitely a crocodile. Uh, it's a crocodile that's had a rough go. Let's see what all is missing on this guy. He's missing a leg somewhere. There he is. Okay, so he's missing a front, mo mo most of his front leg. His face looks all messed up. Uh, maybe a little bit of tail might be missing too. That tail looks pretty good. And the reason I've arrived at saltwater crocodile is just that he doesn't have very many osteoderms on his neck and he's got big gaps in the osteoderms. If you want to know how to identify every single species of crocodilian in existence, we do have an entire video just for you. Mm. This is the longest animal in the world. Maybe not this individual, because this is 25 feet long. This, this group of animals, they get to be the longest animals anywhere on Earth. Uh, that is a siphonophore, which looks a lot like the salp that we saw earlier. It also is colonial. They're often bioluminescent. I, could you tell if that one was bioluminescing? I couldn't tell. Well, they're often, they're often bioluminescent. They're hydrozoans in a really similar way to the salp. They do asexual budding, so they're also colonial. Uh, man of wars are, are siphonophores like this. They, they bud uh, asexually, and so that's how you end up with this giant chain. And then the chain reproduces sexually, and so it's a really similar life cycle, except this is a cnidarian and not a tunicate. So not a chordate, is a cnidarian. Pretty cool. Okay. Hey, 
Oh my god, what is that? Oh, that's so cool. I would like to see one of those. That bit. This is another place on oh my, my god, list what is that? of places I would like to go that doesn't have tigers. That is the largest carnivorin, at least. Uh, and I think I think the largest land predator in all of Madagascar, uh, that is the fossa. Uh, the fossas, they look like cats. They are not, however, cats. They're actually more closely related to mongooses. Uh, but they're, they are part of a group of carnivorans that are unique to Madagascar. So they're endemic there. Uh, and again, I point you to our Afrotheria video where we start talking about the redness of Madagascar and why it's that way, but this is probably a group we should do a video about in the future. But again, this is also the primary predator of lemurs. I think they're the only animal that eats, at least the only mammal, that eats all of the lemur species. And that's really cool. They're also polyandrous, which means that one female mates with many, many males, and promiscuity among females often leads to exaggerated features among males. And so the fossa is incredibly well endowed. <laughs> wow, thanks, Lloyd. Next. Oh, that's hideous. So I'm gonna ignore the use of a crustacean claw for a second. So those are those are eel gobies. I think those are the purple eel goby, but it don't. I, I it's honestly, I'm not positive. But those are eel gobies. Uh, I I love goby fish. Gobies are usually kind of adorable, little bottom dwelling, primarily marine. But I think they get into brackish and probably even. I, I, yeah, they're from freshwater gobies as well. These guys. Like they're they're carnivorous fish. They're found these guys, yeah, these are found in freshwater, saltwater, even up on land. So those guys, like they're not dying. They can they can breathe uh atmospheric air for and get oxygen from, from the atmosphere for quite a while. Um but yeah, those are eel gobies. They look like chestbuster aliens though, don't they? They're freaky as heck. <laughs> okay, Clint, let's yeah. switch to gorillas. Gor oh thank goodness. Mm, I love gorillas. That's a big boy. Oh. He is not super happy. I can smell this video. I love them so much. Okay, so, so the first thing he does, so this is this is a male, I mean, obviously a male gorilla. I'm not sure if, uh, which one. This doesn't look like a mountain gorilla, so I would say it's either an eastern or western lowland gorilla. Probably western lowland gorilla because they're the most common. But anyway, uh, when he, you know, standing up like that, he's he's already showing some aggression, and then obviously the the chest popping. So they they do it with a cupped hand. It's not they don't beat on their chests, and you can hear the sound of it. You know, let's see if I can back it up, and you can hear that. It's, it's a pop, 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 and that's. Yeah, this is it. Isn't that cool? And 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 then you can see. So so he he comes in and his lip is pulled extremely tight. Which that's that's so in his quadrupedal stance, up like that, lip tight. That's one of the lower levels of aggression he could show. So something something about this. I mean, he's surrounded by people there. So something about the situation he didn't like, and it might not even have to do with the people. And there might be another male or something that's come too close, and, but he's, he's showing some low level aggression. The standing up and the, the chest beating, that's a little bit higher, but this is, this is all a threat. He's, at, at least as far as the people that I can see and the camera person, he's not staring right at anybody, which is high level gorilla aggression, but he's just, he's showing he's unhappy. And in addition to all of these visual and, and, and uh, sound cues, he's also almost certainly letting off a pretty pungent musk which you could always tell when the gorillas were starting to get into it because you could smell them from a long way away. And uh, it's not the worst smell, but it is thick. It's a, a thick and, I mean, I can, I can smell this video. <laughs> it's, it's like that. Oh, I love them. But you know, you can see, like this is a, this is a four to 500 pound animal. 
and he's not happy about this, but he's not, he's not doing anything violent. This is all just posturing. He's just communicating. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Okay, what well, is this the last one? Yeah. Emma was immediately captivated by Victoria. He's a sweet boy. Oh, God, he's looking so sweetly. So he's just talking to you today. Yeah, that growling is not an aggressive thing at all. Can you see how it relaxed his face is? He absolutely loves that. Okay. All right, he's a big boy. Yeah, that's so clever. I think I've lost my wife. Hello, baby. Hello, boy. <laughs> oh my god, that's just so sweet. Emma! I think he's completely in love. <laughs> he's smitten. Watching Emma and Victoria was something incredibly beautiful. These beautiful animals, so noble, so gentle, just shows one must never underestimate how extraordinarily beautiful these gorillas are. And that, that is why gorillas are my favorite animals. I, uh, I used to be able to watch them for hours a day and I just you never, ever, ever get bored and I would say of all the animal experiences I could ever have that's the animal experience I would want to have the most well I will tell you that was a lot more fun than I thought it would be uh, if you have more TikTok videos that you would like for me to review in the future please comment those below I mean should we do this again as always like and subscribe and we hope to see you real soon the fossa is incredibly well endowed. Wow, thanks, Glitch. <laughs> 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 and it has <laughs> all over it. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, no big deal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's terrifying. So some guys did, not see, did you see the babies fall out? Surprise, I didn't see that. Said the baby. The ocean. Check out this fish they got, guys. This is absolutely incredible. We should start adding stuff like that to our videos. Something that's not even there. Did you notice this? Will, you know, is potentially a very virile fellow. But imagine if there were like 200 Wills. <laughs> Think if Will had started off by reproducing imagine. himself asexually. I don't, don't want to imagine. If there were 200 Wills, we'd all chain together. Yeah. <laughs> and the next generation would be 100% related to Will. I think 200 is all it would take. <laughs> the entire world. <laughs> no, no, hang on. That's a chupacabra. <laughs> it's clearly a chupacabra. Keep the chupacabra's name out of your mouth. Longest animal in the world? That can't be right. It is. Well, I mean, that's cheating. Is it? Yes. Because it's a colony? Yes. But they're attached to each other. So? Do you ever see a human centipede? <laughs> <laughs> For the record, I haven't seen it, but I do have a friend that was in it.